In this segment, we're going to be talking about the basics of audio preservation, how to reformat, how to playback, how to recover machine-based sound recordings. Upon first receiving a sound recording into a collection, apply some basic common sense. First, do no harm. Basic preservation instincts that you may have learned about paper apply to sound recordings as well. Mold is bad. If it looks physically damaged, it probably is. For instance, you shouldn't immediately run and try to put a tape on a machine because a lot of damage can happen very quickly. CPR is a mnemonic device for us to remember conservation, preservation, and restoration. And as we use those terms, conservation is those actions which you perform on the artifact in order to play it back. Preservation is the act of playing it and digitizing the sound recording. And restoration would be any actions that you would take to enhance its sound, to improve its listenability, but that it would be a change to the artifact, whereas preservation is to capture as much of the original information as possible. When we're talking about preservation of sound recordings, we're differentiating between the artifact, the three-dimensional object, and the intellectual content that's stored on it, what we call in the trade the essence. We use that term in both sound and video, or visual, moving visual. And the artifactual value of the original carrier is often very low in terms of its intellectual content. So when we're doing sound preservation, we're trying to capture as much of the information that is on the carrier, but not the carrier itself. There are some notable examples where that's not the case. If we have, if we could possibly have the original tin foil recording of Thomas Edison saying, Mary had a little lamb, that has very high intrinsic artifactual value. But your run of the mill oral history on a cassette tape that was bought at the drugstore on the way over has very low intrinsic artifactual value. There are two basic kinds of sound recordings, analog sound recordings, that will be encountered in collections. These are mechanical recordings, played back with a stylus, such as cylinders and discs, or magnetic tape-based recordings, such as cassettes and reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Among the analog mechanical playback formats that you'll encounter are cylinders. We have a few samples here. We have the oldest kind, the brown wax. And then we also have, commonly in collections, black cylinders and the blue amberol. They also come in a larger size. These are four and a quarter. They also come in eight inch. And they are either 100 or 200 turns per inch, depending on how much sound they're trying to fit on to the cylinder. We have here a Edison standard phonograph. We've outfitted this with a small speaking horn so that I can uh, get in close to the machine. And we'll crank this up. As you can hear, the machine itself contributes a great deal to the experience of playing back this recording. So as a preservationist, what are we trying to capture? Is it just the sound on the cylinder? Or are we gonna hear some of this playback sound or the mechanics of the machine? The acoustics of the horn, if you move around, you can hear the sound changes. So what would someone in the early 1900s have experienced when listening to this machine? And what, what are we trying to capture as we digitize this sound recording? The other mechanical analog format we're talking about are discs. And discs come in a variety of different sizes. We have here seven, 10, and 12 inch discs. You may also find eight inch and 16 inch discs. There are some oddballs out there, including 20 inch discs. Commercial 78 RPM discs rarely turned at 78 RPM. 
There's a wide range from 70.29 RPM all the way up to 80 RPM. And these vary because different manufacturers were trying to do something just enough different from what their competitors were doing to get around their competitors' patents. In addition to the varying speeds, 78s also differ from disk to disk based on their size of the stylus, the groove size, and the playback equalization will vary from period to period, brand to brand, disk to disk. We have here two 78 RPM recordings, and they're very different. This one is a commercial release. This is an instantaneous recording, much as you might do with a cassette recording. This is a shellac disc, and this is a lacquer. On the shellac disc, you can usually recognize these. They'll have a printed manufacturer's label on them. They're made from the same material all the way through. And this is a lacquer recording. This disc is made in layers. It's got a base, it's usually aluminum, sometimes it's glass, sometimes cardboard. And you can differentiate it with the label as well. The label's usually typed or handwritten. This disc would also have multiple holes in it. And the label was put on this after it was recorded. But if you feel carefully, you can hear, feel the divots for where the extra holes are. There are two common problems with lacquer or acetate discs. The first is this. This is palmitic acid. It has the plasticizer leaching out of the disc and contaminating the surface. It's possible to clean this off. You can see this disc, which had suffered from the same palmitic acid residue, has been cleaned. The other common problem with these discs is the recording layer flaking off. This is delamination. You can see here it's part of the recording layer has flaked off of the disc. When handling these discs, it's important to wear gloves because the acid in your fingers, then the oil in your fingertips promotes both of these conditions. Common to all forms of preservation, one of the most important things to do is properly clean the media. So we have a machine made specially for that. This thing will make a little bit of a racket, but we'll get this thing going. Oops. This is just distilled water that we're putting on here. And the nylon brush that gets deep down into the grooves. Give it a good scrubbing. Move that away. And turn on a little air pump. And then there's a little pump that sucks the water and whatever else was down in the grooves out. Takes it away to a hazardous waste site. The other commonly encountered disc format will be LPs. Most people would be familiar with these still. And they're usually a bit thinner than our 78 cousins. They'll often be labeled as LP for long playing microgroove. And they're like the shellac discs, made of the same material all the way through, in this case, polyvinyl chloride instead of shellac. And they also bend. I mean, they're really easy to identify. So if you have a disc that will bend, it's a, an LP. If you have a shellac, it's a little bit thicker, but if you try to bend it, magnetic tape first appears around the Second World War. The very earliest tape is paper-based. That's very rare. Followed by acetate-based tape. Subsequently, we have polyester-based tape. And there's some other technologies in there, principally PVC tape, which is also very unusual. The most commonly encountered tape types are polyester and acetate. Tape is referred to by its base. The part of the tape that carries the recording layer. So we have here acetate tape and polyester tape. And acetate tape is translucent, made from the same materials as motion picture film, and you can shine a light through it. As opposed to polyester tape, which is opaque. You'll find tape coming on a variety of different size of reels. The most common size is 7 inch. You also have 10 half inch, very common in collections that would come out of radio stations or professional recording situations but that you'll find smaller reels as well. These are common in field recordings. Tape also comes in a variety of widths. We have here quarter inch, half inch, 
one inch and two inch tape. Usually a quarter inch tape will be for a stereo recording and then the wider widths are for multi-track. Reels come in two flavors, plastic and metal reels. These are usually glued or sonic welded and the metal reels are in pieces. This is handy to know because if you have a jam and a tape, you can disassemble the reel. Usually three screws on a small reel. They can get inside and access to the tape. One of the situations you may encounter is because the reels come apart, frequently the reels will be taken apart and reused on another tape, leaving the tape in a box without flanges. This is a very difficult situation where waiting for trouble to happen. In order to get this tape out of the box, what you're going to do is take a empty flange, line it up over the holes, put it on the pancake. What you want to do, avoid doing is grabbing the pancake from the hub and pulling it out of the tape pack. Nearly all problems that you experience playing back cassettes are related to the shell. There are components that fail, get old, get rusty, and the tape won't play back smoothly. So the, all you need to do is replace the shell. And the shells come in two flavors. There is this, which has five screws holding it together, and this is a sonic welded shell. And the sonic welded plastic, they take the two halves, touch them to each other, and then vibrate them at a very high frequency. The friction of them vibrating melts the edge and causes them to fuse into a single piece. It's a very common technique in plastic manufacturing. Unfortunately, it makes it very difficult for us to get into the tape to uh, replace the shell. There's a couple of ways of doing this. The one I like to use entails these tools. I don't recommend you trying this. This is the shell you want to deal with. This is much easier to take apart. And then you very gingerly move the tape to a fresh shell. Sources for the fresh shells are to go to a local store, buy a brand new tape. Any familiar brand will have a good shell and you throw away the blank tape and just use the shell. Other than physical distortion, the most common problem encountered with polyester based tape is sticky shed syndrome. In sticky shed, the binder is failing and making the surface of the tape sticky again. The common test for this is just to see whether the tape will spool evenly off the reel. And you can see this tape is sticking to itself. If we were to tr try to play this tape, you would hear the telltale squeal that comes from the binder sticking to the heads and the guides on the machine. I want to, uh, uh, I want you to hear this wonderful uh, music, and I think it was a duet from... Uh... And there's a tremendous amount of mythology surrounding Sticky Shed. I've been very surprised to find very little hard research done about this problem. The common practice of baking tapes to treat them for Sticky Shed is not based in science whatsoever. If you trace the audit trail back through the, the uh, academic research, if we can call it that, through the articles and the trades, it, you end up with a cardboard box with a hairdryer in it, not exactly what we normally think of as hard science. There's a very well now well-known article from the IEEE Journal by Bertram and Cudahy that does some absolutely hard science research into the problem of sticky shed. And what the Bertram and Cudahy article finds is that the problem is not with temperature, but with humidity. So that in a cardboard box with a hairdryer, you raise the heat and therefore the humidity boils off. The reaction is reversible. So that if you have higher humidity, you get sticky tape. And if you can re reduce the humidity below the equilibrium point, then the humidity, the moisture in the tape evaporates and the polyurethane bonds reestablish and the tape is no longer sticky. And the critical point for that is something around room temperature. It's a little chilly, it's 65 degrees, 
So if you have a storage area that is below 40% humidity for an extended period of time, you get the same results, but without exposing the tape to the potential damage of heating them. Storage is fairly straightforward. You want to keep things in a clean environment. Generally, you would store objects on end, disks you store on end, tapes you store on end, and cylinders you would store on end. And generally, somewhere in the order of about 65, hopefully below 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and somewhere around 35% humidity. More important than the absolute temperature or the absolute humidity is stability. You want to avoid either the temperature or the humidity moving very far, very fast. Without any question, the most significant thing that you can do where you will have the biggest impact on the quality of the preservation is on the analog side. The quality of the analog playback matters more than the resolution that you choose. You want to use very high quality equipment, experienced, trained operators, accustomed to handling these formats. And it's not just about doing no harm. It's about understanding the media and what is involved with optimizing the playback, particularly for fragile or damaged media. The choice of a preservation technology is dependent upon who you are, what institutional infrastructure you have for doing things. Well, for a very small institution, for a small historical society has a shoebox full of cassette tapes, reformatting those to CDs, a format that they understand that they're gonna know how to handle and how to migrate, makes a certain kind of sense. That same institution putting that same data on data tape makes the preservation strategy very fragile because nobody there really understands what this object is. The flip side is that if you have a very large quantity of material, you know, you put 400, 800 gigabytes on a data tape, and that's a thousand CDs. They, that's not something that's gonna migrate very gracefully. So if you have a large quantity of material, you want a technology that doesn't require a lot of handling. Hard drive storage is another option. There are some misconceptions, generally for preservation. If we're talking about hard drive storage, we're not talking about running down to the local office supply and grabbing a $200 hard drive. This is usually much more sophisticated storage raids, the heavy iron that the bursar is keeping the financial records on, for instance. This is much more expensive, much more reliable hardware. Nonetheless, if you're a small institution, and you've got $200 for your storage going down to the local office supply, buy two drives, if you've got multiple copies of the materials, send one off-site, that's a much better strategy than doing nothing. For sound preservation, the format that is being stored in the sound file is PCM, pulse code modulation. This is exactly the same format that's used on audio CDs. The frequency with which the sound is sampled and the resolution that the dynamic range is stored is usually much higher. On a CD, it's 44,100 samples per second, and for preservation, we're usually at more than twice that, at 96 kilohertz. For the bit depth, CDs hold 16-bit, and for preservation, we're usually working in 24-bit. And the reason we use those higher resolutions is for 99 and 44, 100% of the materials that you're looking at, these resolutions vastly exceed the source material. In the segment on preservation basics, we discussed the archival set, preservation master, access copy, and a web accessible copy. Best practice is for the preservation masters to be as true to the original as possible. Warts and all, noises, clicks, pops, breaks, Whereas for the access copy, sometimes it'll be enhanced in some way, such as removing the clicks and pops from old disks.